Hello, everyone, and welcome to Access Chat. Today we have Antonio and myself, and uh, Neil is on holiday with his wife, and um, we really thought it was probably better that he enjoyed Barcelona instead of uh, joining us on Access Chat today. And we have a really interesting guest that Neil met and invited to the program. His name is Shelton Newsham. I should uh, make sure if I'm saying that incorrectly, we'll let Shelton uh, explain that. But he is a, um, we call him a police officer in the United States. But Shelton, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us your title and tell us a little bit more about this really amazing story that we're going to talk about today. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Shelton Newsham, so it's close enough. Um, I'm um, the Prevent and Protect Lead at uh, the Yorkshire and Humber Regional Cybercrime Unit. So what that really means is, in relation to protect, that's um, sort of threat mitigation for organisations and individuals, helping them keep safe online, um, educating CEOs, boards, implementing policies and procedures. And then the prevent aspect, which is what we're going to uh, mainly focus on today. Um, that's about finding those gifted kids, finding the kids that have got those special traits, those really ones that, that don't know what to do, they don't know the strengths that they've got and the power that they've got and actually what future they can have. Um, so we, however we um, engage with them, whether that's through a referral or because they've been investigated something, because that sometimes happens, um, and we then give them a positive pathway, show them the uh, positive lights in relation to cyber, and then we can, um, you know, they, we help through education, through the teachers, and then help them get the confidence to apply for jobs uh, within the sector. Wow, that's amazing! That's amazing. We we don't we don't hear a lot of times. We just hear the negative stories. We don't hear the positive stories, and so. This is very exciting and very unique. So can, can you give us an example of, you know, uh, maybe a few stories of, without telling the names, of course, you know, understanding the privacy, but maybe give us a few examples of um, people you've worked with? Well, we, we had one um, investigation where um, actually the parent was uh, very positive, but um, didn't really understand um, his son's skills and abilities. Now, this uh, individual came to us um, via an investigation. It happens. We, you know, uh, an offence is uh, alleged. Um, so our pursuit team, our investigation team would f follow the evidence, got found out uh, who this uh, child was and, and straight away understood that it wasn't malicious. Um, it was a he was, he was testing himself. Unfortunately, that took him over the boundaries of the computer misuse, act into a criminal offence. Um, but really, do, does does that warrant going through the court prosecution system, or actually is education and support the way forward? Um, we all work together, so you know we're not in separate units. We're in one large unit in the cybercrime unit, so um, we're always talking to each other. So we took um, this individual on. Um, we visit the house. We go through what his thought processes are, what he, how, um, how, how he was trying to test himself, and then give him that support and education. We also give some support for the parents, uh, especially the father. Um, and because he was quite gifted, we put him forward for um, a northern. Um, it's an initiative where we put people through where they're tested. They're given talks from the National Crime Agency. Um, and it's like a, it's like a panel in a workshop and the parents go along and they're given inspiring stories from technology, um, how their skills can be used for good, consequences, of course, of carrying on and down that uh, uh, line. Um, and he he really understood. He really um, got to, um, you know, because we, we, we make sure that the people who are doing the talking understand that certain people who've got autism, it's. They're not going to, you know, they, they react in a certain way to certain questions. So you've got to make sure that you make sure that the lights are dim and things. So, so it's, you know, so the, there's more interaction. And as a result of that, um, his father let, wrote a letter and said he's a totally different person. He's got some more confidence. His social skills have grown. Mm -hmm. um, he hasn't um, committed any further offences. And he is looking um, at going around the 
technical route uh, when he's at school, uh, which is which is what we want. We want people to be in this industry. There's not, you know, there's going to be a deficit. Right. And right. the fact of the matter are that um, some neuro, you know, neurodiverse individuals have got the traits and the qualities to do those jobs. They just lack the confidence and sometimes the understanding of others um, to give them the opportunity. So yeah. Yeah, that that is such a powerful story and. Cybercrime is such a big, big thing right now, mm. and I, um, and and a lot of times we just hear the negative stories. And mm. there was a story in Virginia of uh, a young woman who, 16 year old, that was posting inappropriate pictures of her body parts mm -hmm. online, mm. and um, the parents didn't know, and uh, they didn't know until the police officer showed up on the doorstep and mm. told her that told them that you know not only was this girl in trouble, but the parents were in trouble since she was underage, and and the it, it was just such it was such a, a a sad story because we did not use this as an educational opportunity, not only for the family and the individual, but everybody else as well. And so it, um, it, it and you see this so much. And, and I have a daughter that's 31 years old with Down syndrome, and she is so good on, on social media that sometimes she hasn't done it as much recently. And, and you can't watch them every second of the day, no. but she'll post inappropriate pictures and I'll hear about it. She posted, it was an innocent picture and law wouldn't have gotten involved with this, but she posted, she ate a strawberry and the, the strawberry juice was running down her face and she posted she was a vampire queen. And so my sister's like, she shouldn't be posting that, but this is such a big, big, big conversation. And I, I know that I am so grateful that you're looking at this as an opportunity to improve people's lives. And so that is, we want this story to be heard because we demonize um, our law enforcement so often. I know it's very, we really do that a lot here in the United States. I, I can't speak as much for you in the UK, but it, it's, it's a real problem here in the United States. And so to see a program like this where you're going in and trying, you're seeking to understand, but even more than that, that that's really it. it sort of brings um, emotion into me, certainly. Uh, it, it's a really beautiful story. And um, how do you deal with it? I'm gonna ask you this one last question and then I'm gonna turn it over to Antonio because I know he'll have great questions, but because it is so big and it's moving so fast and what we're doing and how we're doing and how we're pulling in. And I read a terrible story yesterday about a, a, a boy that was 10 years old with a coloscopy bag that was being bullied in school and he committed suicide. So the cyberbullying and all of that comes into this. So how do you even begin to get your head around this, Shelton? If, if we're honest, a lot of things with the bullying, uh, posting of pictures, it's it's just moved into a digital um, a digital arena. Um, okay. and, and a lot of the times, like the, the girl who's posted the pictures, um, we used to, you know, all, all that that bully that used to say one thing. Now they write something that it never disappears offline. It's always there. Once you've said a comment, you cannot take it back. Um, what we do here in the UK, uh, certainly in in giving the example of the, the first example with the girl, it's that's an educational process. So we wouldn't be looking at prosecuting. We would look and we would go. Um, we would go around. We would talk to the uh, the individual involved and, and the parents together to educate about indecent images across social media, but also the consequences for her, because right. again, it never disappears. And, and, and children might send a picture to a boyfriend at the time because it's the, the love of their life. And they don't have that understanding that actually that their thought process may change and that person may not be their boyfriend or girlfriend for the rest of their life and they now have access to images. So it, it's got to be an educational process. It's got to empower kids to learn and understand what social media is and for the positives and the negatives, as well as parents. Parents right. need to and, understand. Right, and I'm gonna bring up one more yeah. thing that made this even more difficult, and I'm gonna turn the mic over to Antonio, mm -hmm. but um, also I forgot this point, and this point chilled me as a parent because we've all, we're always telling our kids, you know, I was always told as a kid, 
um, don't get into cars with strangers. They're going to stop and offer. You can't, all that, right? Well, to make this even worse, what happened was she was being paid by pornography site and they were almost luring her to do this and they were paying her a lot of money for this so you had that really scary aspect also yeah which you know our, our children are so vulnerable and sometimes our children with disabilities like my daughter are even more vulnerable so yeah. i forgot that really mm -hmm. creepy important part in that there are predators that are after us i i, I don't want to be paranoid but it's true um, and so I want you to comment on that, and Antonio um, wants to go next. Sorry, Antonio, for going so on so long. Yeah, yeah, just, just, yeah, quickly on that. You, you will always get somebody who will try to take advantage of the vulnerable, whether that's physically, you know, offline or online. And again, education for parents. We spend a lot of time, and we've got packs for, uh, for educational packs for parents that we give them. That again, it's about giving them the strength and their courage and confidence to be able to discuss it with their children and what the threats are. But to be able to do that, they've got to understand it as well. Uh, uh, in, relation to, in, in what age group are you, be, are you focusing more in, in, in relation to those kids? Um, the, the main age groups that we look at now are between 11 and 17 years old. Um, there are different for the prevent cyber prevent is between those age groups because that's when they really start discovering their skills and kind of get that thought process on whether they want to push themselves a little bit further we do have younger children that might knock their friends offline on a computer game and ddos their friend or something because but a lot of the time it's that's an accidental thing or it's just a pure learning thing. But to be impactive, to educate and also to make sure they've got the pathways to picking their options for exams and further education, the 11 to 17 um, age group is, is where, we cons where we focus our attention at the moment. So when, when, you, when you look back to the information that you have from those kids about their skills, uh, are you able to find a kind of a pattern in relation to their uh, home environment? Are their parents uh, come from a technical background or the kids have developed the skills on their own uh, with, with their peers? Uh, how, uh, what are the things that you are able to find that, are, that allows you also to, when you have a new case, to, to, to go more, to be more focused and identify things in a more effective way? So for um, how uh, children develop is a number of, you have peer-to-peer -peer development, um, you know, the latest games and how they're going to get a cheat or to get the grades up and that, that, that happens quite a lot. A lot of children educate themselves, they hear stories at school, they learn that people a couple of years older are, are doing this on, on this certain game, are doing that, have learned how to you know, code this or write um, some script, um, and they challenge themselves. Um, we do have a couple that have technical parents and they're brought up in that environment, but I also know quite a few that live in deprived areas where um, the parents have said, don't go outside, it's too dangerous come inside, they've got to come here, and they're inside, and they're developing their own skills. The negative side of that is that the parents don't know the vulnerabilities of being online all the time, and again, that's where education comes in. But the thought processes of, uh, of, of the child is they're in, they're in a safe environment, they're going to uh, task themselves. So it's a combination, really. There's no real standout. Um, certainly anybody that's um, neurodiverse is self-development. It's really challenging themselves um, and their, you know, um, and that's where they develop their skills from. No, uh, because uh, teachers also have an important role in, in terms of, uh, so, uh, um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I, look, I look back to the school where my daughter is, and you end up in a scenario where people have, and teachers have all sets of skills. Some teachers are more interested in technology, Others, they would prefer that school was like it was in the 80s and in the 70s. They are really scared of computers themselves. Yeah. Uh, are you doing any work with in, within schools in order to educate teachers, make them aware of this? And 
Because you know, a few years ago, when I was a kid, uh, I used to have people going to my school explain me, you know, how to eat well, how to brush my teeth, you know, all those things. Mm -hmm. And today we, we need to to that is that is still important and always will will be. But things have changed, and this type of culture and knowledge needs to be built in from an early stage. Or are you doing any work in that specific area? Yeah, so um, to, to put it in some context, on Tuesday and Wednesday this week, two of my officers were with two sets of 600 children um, going through skills, running uh, workshops. We uh, gave out, uh, we have, whilst we have parent education packs, we have teachers education packs and knowledge packs to give them the confidence. Because when, when depending, and you're exactly right, Antonio, in, in relation to the backgrounds of some teachers, not all teachers pick to go into technical and study a technical subject. Sometimes it's, it's, they're, they're asked to cover that position. Um, and a lot of the time, just going from a curriculum and an acad academic notes that are, are generic, when you're trying to educate on computer misuse acts, positive and things like that, um, they, they don't have the credibility in the classroom because some children know more. And, and I think it's our job as well to help those teachers and give them context to give them you know, more resources that enable them, exactly like you say, to understand and learn. And also, you know, that, that child that's not engaging at the back of the class, um, that might not because they're being rude and they're ignoring what they say. Um, they may be neurodiverse or that teacher might be speaking at a level that's too low and, 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 and intelligence wise, we just they're just not engaged. So they need to have that understanding as well that sometimes it's not, it's not their fault if, if a child doesn't engage. And I think by giving that information, giving them that context, it gives them the confidence. You know, this is so important. This is so important because there's, you know, I, I think back to, once again, you, we can't help but go back to our own childhood mm -hmm. and the, the, what we had to worry about then and, and how we learn from our peers. I, I remember being in elementary school and somebody asking me if I was a virgin and I didn't know what it meant, but I did know enough at that time that the girl that was asking me I understood she was um, a little bit more sophisticated about certain subjects that my mother would not want me to be sophisticated about at the time. And I, I could tell by the way she was asking it that I sh which answer I should give because I didn't know what she was talking about. But, but it's, and I remember it was scandalous. This is how old I am. It was scandalous. The boys were taking my name, Deborah, which is spelled D-E-B-R-A, and saying Debra, and it was scandalous. <laughs> now it's like, <laughs> it, that sounds ridiculous yeah. now based mm. on what you're having to deal with. And mm. so I think this program is so important, and I, I, I applaud you for doing it. I would also wonder, are you also teaching other law enforcement agencies outside your, because I would actually like you to come over here to the United States, please. And mm. I mean, and, and I would like to have you on my other show, which is um, a lot of US audience, because mm. instead, one thing I think we've also forgotten about our, our police officers and our law enforcement is that they're here to help society be better. Mm. They're not just here as punishing you. and. Right. And it's gotten really weird, the energy between the police officers and the citizens in some countries like the U.S. And so it seems like there's an opportunity for you to also educate other law enforcement officials. So, I mean, with the with the prevent program, it's an it is a national program. Some of us are doing a lot of different ways to try and uh, drive it forward. Um, and I'll mention later a, a competition that we run. but. Um, there are a lot so there is another 12 of me around the uk with the teams doing the same work in different ways so that law enforcement in the uk really does understand the prevent initially it understands education and actually you know putting it um and just giving a little bit more context before i joined the unit which was like 19 months ago i used to run a, a couple uh, some teams and 
you, you you used to get reports of an image being sent to another child, boyfriend, girlfriend's indecent image being sent, and an officer would go. And even at, you know, and at, at that level, the officer on the street going, they know that actually, it probably happened in the past in a different way. It's, you can argue if it's age appropriate, but it's not malicious. It's understandable that it's happened. It is not in the public interest. And we, and, and he, at that level on um, sending images and things like that, it would be a conversation with the parents on both sides and the reference of that, of that the, the crime that had taken place would get recorded and then just um, written off as it's not in the public interest. It's an educational process. So I, I, I have to say that a lot of the law enforcement here um, are really doing an understanding that aspect. What we are trying to push additionally is understanding, understanding the neurodiverse issues that so if you go to a, a violent child or a domestic situation where there is a child there, sometimes the parents haven't had a diagnosis of their children and sometimes the parents haven't been diagnosed themselves. And if you put physical contact onto some individuals, their reaction, a bit like we were talking about earlier, is to lash out, is to have a violent reaction, which then causes a violent reaction by the officer. And the next minute we're wrestling and we're fighting with somebody who only reacted because they were uncomfortable, not because they were being malicious against the officer. So we're looking at um, developing some guides for officers for um, autism, for when they first go to instance, and also for when they're speaking to them and interviewing them. Um, so in that respect, yes, we're, 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 at, we're trying to add some additional benefits um, and learning for officers. And, and I'm just going to um, tell the quick, quickly the story that we were referring to because we were talking about it off air and then I'm going to turn it back over to Antonio. But in the United States there, you know, we've had a lot of, you know, everybody has problems with this. And there was a man with Down syndrome that was, um, he, he was a full grown man and he was a very big man. And he was watching a movie with his uh, sister or his caregiver and um, the caregiver or the, the you know, the person was this, with them left at the theater a little bit early, earlier, maybe went to the rest, restroom or something. And the man wanted to watch the movie again and he started getting belligerent and the theater staff called the police. Things got very quickly out of control and a police officer, as they were trying to hold him down, he, his, uh, he got, his neck was broken and he was strangled and he died. And he only wanted to watch the movie again and you know the police officers didn't come in there to kill this man. Of course they didn't, but uh, we've heard stories like this, and they're chilling. And they're chilling for everybody involved. Let's you know make that clear. But that's why the work you're doing with the neurodiversity, because this is such a huge topic for all of us. But then you add the neurodiversity into it, and it takes on all these other dynamics. And Shelton, you know, I don't know if you want to comment on that. And then Antonio, I know you have another question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, again, um, certainly the law enforcement, they, they do a lot of work, there's a lot of training, but we need to start looking at neurodiversity for an investigation side, because a lot of the time, if it's a prolonged investigation, once you identify somebody who may have committed offence, and you're going to interview and, and a care plan for if they're going to a custody or doing something like that, they need to know, because people need to know that, you know, bright lights, persistent questioning, if somebody's not looking you in the face, it's not because they're hiding something, it's it's a trait that they've got, it's just, you know, and, and I think that's the type of education that we're starting to, uh, to, to, to bring in now via the cybercrime units. And there are quite a lot of partners out there uh, you know the autism society and that that give us the necessary tools to be able to put that into a, a police language because a lot of things need to be put into a police language um, to then again assist the officers um, and and that's that's the key part. Antonio. Antonio, you're on mute, sweetheart. So, uh, I'm particularly interested on the on the on the on the learning path. So, when you identify those kids, hmm. 
um, all, uh, is there a learning path for them? How you, you know you are able to identify their potential? How you what's the the follow up? So what we would originally do, like some of the children, um, it could be as basic as they just like coding, they just like gaming. So we know every coding um, um, club in our region in um and our region is vast and we know every coding club so we will straight away give them something that they've been looking for we will signpost them to that then from there every three or usually three months um we speak to their parents again we will revisit we will see how that has done and whether they've got um you know if they're content with their learning and that because they may then want to go into game development. They may want to do something else. So as we go, and if they're the 11 to 14 year old range in the UK, we will keep that contact up and help them with options because they may not need to go down a technical route in their options for their further education and things, depending on what they want to do. And also, you know, a key thing is that not all um, security developers need university degrees you are skilled by ability and so we make sure they understand that because there are individuals that are that gifted but they're not conducive to high school education and college and will always be disruptive for one of a better phrase for teachers and other, other, other students so we also give them an understanding and their parents key an understanding that actually as they go older it might be worth looking at more of a vocational or um, um, an internship as they go up or um, you know because actually learning on the job and doing maybe one day in class because you've got to stay into education until you're 18 in the UK um, would be more conducive to them learning their skills so it, it's a it's a person by person um, decision on how we interact and how we then give them the pathway because many will give them will say it's go to these courses then go to this universities these universities look at these courses and actually you know we've got some around here chef uh, sheffield for once one uh, is one of them at leeds beckett they've got really good science programs um but they've also got development programs within that um so they can do a multitude of things um and again a lot of it is picking the right subjects that's right for that individual not because the subject fits a part of the cybersecurity industry if that makes sense it's got to be an individual otherwise we're not helping individuals we're putting pu putting people in a bracket and and saying you must do this to achieve that and that won't work so we had uh, several discussions on this topic of talent management because i do other uh, other work in other communities that relate with talent with recruitment and where we have regular conversations on Twitter, you know, chats on cybersecurity, on talent, and is often uh, a topic that almost everyone agrees is in this area of cybersecurity, um, the top individuals they don't come from university background. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's actually extremely rare mm -hmm. to find a top individual who comes yeah. from that area, and sometimes uh, they come from university background, but they don't come from that technical area they come from other areas yes but they develop that by themselves yes so um, considering that the skills that they they acquire uh, you it's, it's important that when they end up in any kind of formal education vocational or any other that the organizations that are going to receive them can also understand them and how they work and the best way for them to learn um, uh, you mentioned the coding schools but are there other organizations that you often recommend them to go because they actually are in the same mindset in the same approach that you are following yeah there, there's there's i mean depending on so we've got i mean we work with cybersecurity challenge uk we work with other uh, organizations um and do local events so we would do local road shows local events like that because if we're honest there aren't you know people 
um, putting a club on costs money and a coding club fits a certain specific area of people, skill set and interest. But as you've just said, Antonio, it, it, there are so many skill sets. There are non-technical skill sets that may develop in the future. Into, it, you don't need, and, and that's another thing, they don't need to be technical to be in information security and cyber security. Um, so yeah, and we, we, that's why we deal with individuals as they are, and then we can, we can get speakers in who are experts in neurodiversity, and we will, again, give them the confidence to understand why they're struggling to listen to the teacher and things like that. Um, we give the support for the uh, for obviously for the parents. Um, so yeah, we will tailor and we will talk to the different local charities, whether it's the Autis Autism uh, Society, um, because this is all about the individual. It's for too long we have tried to fit the masses into a small um, to parallel lines and make sure everybody fits with the PREVENT programme and with what we're doing is, this is an individual based programme to give them the strengths. Because just because somebody has committed a, a, a cyber crime, a computer misuse act on one occasion, that doesn't mean they're a technical person. It doesn't mean, it means that they're going to have that trait and they will be neuro, they are neurodiverse. But that doesn't mean that they are going to be a cyber security expert of the future. They may have committed a cyber crime. It's our job to go in to talk to them, explain what's right or wrong, and actually their interests may be elsewhere. But that doesn't stop us supporting them and interacting with them and saying, well, actually, if you want to do that and you're more, you know, you're analytical and you want to do just mathematics or things like that, or you want to do, you're more process driven. Well, these are the types of education and jobs you could do. We don't because we're the cyber crime unit doesn't mean we, that we fit everybody into cyber crime and, and push them in that general direction. No, um, for kids, you know, when you are crossing the street, you know, you know the sign is uh, green or red. Yeah. When you are exploring the web, when you are doing so, you don't really have a sign saying, oh, you are going to the, the wrong zone, you need to stop here. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, I, so I think the work that you are doing is uh, is, is actually reveals a lot of sense and a lot of empathy mixed with this uh, you know, uh, educating people for uh, the importance of, uh, of uh, and, and the parents uh, as well. But have you uh, considered, especially the, the, the ones who are in an older age, uh, as a pool of talent to recruit? Or, and, or if, if you have been approached by organizations about also recruiting and finding how can they tap into that talent and recruit them into uh, into the industry? So there are a lot of um, organizations that say they are and, and things like that. And, and I think a lot of the organizations understand that uh, neurodiversity is not a negative, it's a positive, it's, you know, the, the, the traits are really good. For us, we started, our unit started the first uh, intern program in regional cybercrime units. There's other units that are now going to start taking that on. Um, our interview process uh, was different. Our We, not HR, vetted our applications because applications aren't conducive to some people. They don't like them and everything's literal. And we had, um, we did our interviews uh, latter end of last year uh, for, the, for the next program, which will start in August. And we had um, one line answers for the entire application form, one line. And that person, well, there were a couple, they got interviews. If it was a, a, um, a HR officer or something just looking at, oh, an intern, well, they haven't answered the question. Well, that doesn't make it make any sense. Um, they would have, I'm sure you call it a paper sift as well, but they would have got sifted out and that wouldn't have got to the final thing. We, we vetted our own and there's got to be a lot of responsibility on organisations to either make sure HR, their HR understand it's an individual for a role and actually a generic form won't work or the people that are running the area of business that, that person is going to go into 
that they do the SIFs on all those application forms because we were right to um, let them application forms through because when we went to interview, our interviews again are structured totally different um, so that it's, it, it empowers everybody to take an interest and it looks at different skills but you can then see and you know straight away. Um, and I will just say that we were right on the people that excelled in our intern recruitment that those two where they were just one line that may have been discarded by others we were right because we knew what we were looking for but that is exactly the same in organizations it needs to be the people that know what they're looking for that do the uh, um, the vetting of the forms and make and make those reasonable adjustments that's so powerful what you're doing because I, we know um, there's been studies done all over the world, but studies here in the United States where we're finding um, respectability to a study where we found that 65% of people incarcerated in the United States um, uh, have disabilities, have neurodiversity mm -hmm. issues. And, you know, we might even argue it's higher than that, but that, you know, 65% isn't good. And we, um, we do a lot of incarceration of um, mm -hmm. citizens in the United States. Yeah. We, uh, we like to think we're number one and we are number one there and we're not really thrilled with being number mm -hmm. one. So I, I like programs like yours that is there to educate and really help individuals, mm -hmm. as you're saying, be successful. But how you're tying it into employment and internships, I mean, that is just, I want to cheer for you. I want to give you a hug, Shelton. That is so powerful how you're tying, because... I think of one of the most notorious hackers, most successful notorious hackers, had autism. Mm. So obviously, this individual is brilliant yeah. with a lot of this new stuff that we don't even understand as society. Mm. So yeah. I, I just love the empowering way that you're doing this. And I understand it. It is sticking your finger in the dike. It's, this is so huge. And, and I imagine, and I don't know this for sure, Shelton, but... A crime is committed in your area, but it might be a, this crime might affect you know everybody else because it's the internet, so it's the world. Yeah. So yeah. jurisdiction must get confusing. Um, I guess you do it based on where people are. Yeah. But um, go ahead. Yeah, 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 we do. Um, but communication um, is better. You know, we we have liaisons for U.S. law enforcement, international law enforcement. So communication, certainly in relation to cybercrime, is very good. It's very good. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we are so, so impressed with you. And I know we're out of time. And we definitely want to have you come back on Access Chat again because this is – we applaud you. We applaud you, Shelton, and all of the teams and all of the lives that you're changing and improving. And, you know, we know this in the United States. You know, if, if, if you can't help an individual um, – find who they are and maybe really embrace their life, uh, they might, uh, you know, we have all this horrible violence in the United States in our schools right now. And um, all of these things tied together. They tie together and we must understand this as a society. So we really, really applaud what you're doing. And I, I, we want to thank Barclays who supports uh, Access Chat and My Clear Text, which we love what they do. Elaine and Orla, they're just amazing. And and, you know, we really, really applaud you, Shelton, and, and we want to help you. So we're always here. I know that Antonio, like he mentioned, he's involved in other mm. chats and other conversations. And so don't be surprised that he's going to come no, knock on your door I, and say, I, Shelton, I, come on. <laughs> no, but I still, I couldn't let, let Shelton go without just asking a, just a, a small question, because uh, so, uh, especially in the social channels, you uh, there are many other organizations that are involved you know social network are, are involved do you have any engagement with them uh, to see how they can uh, at least sometimes be more alert to the way how they design their platforms uh, to avoid things because sometimes just by the way how you design a platform uh, the way how the platform is enabled or even the the terms and conditions can create a lot of issues here so are you doing any engagement with social networks also to create them awareness about the responsibility that they have we we we've tried it's been it's been dealt with uh, they're trying at a national level 
Um, if we're if we're honest about it, we 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 are pushing. Um, it's about educating mass corporate bodies. Um, and the National Crime Agency are working to try and try and educate on on these areas, um, and it has to be a national government steer to make that. Um, we can push, we can make things, you know, and, and make them aware of things, but they will only listen when there is a national steer and national uh, push towards it. Uh, but every organised crime unit, every regional cyber crime unit, know they're trying to, and and how we communicate online is in 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 the best way possible to get our message across to all avenues of the community. And I think you're 100 percent right that social network sites and platforms they need to understand as well. But it's got to come from the top. Well said, well said. Shelton, thank you, thank you, thank you for being no on the program and for your work. And gosh, we applaud what you're doing. And um, and we really want to get out, you know, make sure that people know what you're doing so that they can follow your lead and learn from you and we can make society a better place for everyone. So thank you once again to you. Thank you, Antonio and Neil and all of our lovely sponsors. And, and we will have fun on Tuesday talking about this on Twitter. Thank That's you, Shelton. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye.